Hi weaving friends, coming to you from my slightly disheveled studio. I have tried to do a little bit of a tidy up but it's just been so difficult lately. It's been a really busy month and I'm working on a bunch of projects and some of them are like, you know, I've got the sewing machine over here and I've got things that I'm cutting up over there and I've got things that I'm weaving over there and it just all sort of becomes a bit of a jumble. But I guess a creative mess is a good mess because it means that things are happening. The weaving school this month has just gone exploded, which is fantastic. And thank you to anyone who has signed up for a membership or bought a class this month. It's so good to see so many people learning to weave or improving on their own weaving journeys. Such good stuff. So today we're gonna to talk a little bit about fringes. And I'm gonna show you a couple of examples of fringes, what you might do with fringes on different occasions for different projects. But the main question and the main part of this tutorial is to show you what to do with a fringe when you actually don't want the fringe to be there. Yes, believe it or not, there are people out there who are just not fans of fringes. And although I'm a little, little bit of a fringe fan myself, I can understand that there are times when you just don't want that fringe for all kinds of reasons. We're gonna talk about some of those reasons today too. So I'm gonna show you some of my past projects, the fringe treatments that I've done with them. And then I'm gonna show you what I do to a fringe that I don't want anymore. But here's the important part, for people who don't have a sewing machine, because not everyone has a sewing machine and can just go ahead and hem that fringe. And you don't always want a hem on your piece anyway. Okay, so let's get into the first piece. Okay, so before I show you the first piece, I am going to be mentioning a lot of projects, tools, etc. today. Anything that I mention in the video, I will try to leave a link to it down below if you are interested in it and you want to do some further research. So all the links will be underneath and if you can't see them, you can click on more and the menu will drop down and you'll be able to see all of the links that I've put there for you. So the first project is one of my earlier weaving projects actually. Um, one that I'm still very pleased with. I think it's really lovely. I think I might have shown this before in another video, but you know, after the 200th or so video, I think I've got 270 or something now, the mind gets a little foggy. So this one, I hand dyed the yarn for both the warp and the weft. So for the warp, I did a mostly pink color. And for the weft, I did the same kind of pink with some greens incorporated as well. But what I mainly wanted to show you about this scarf was that for the fringe treatment, I did just a simple series of knots after I had taken the scarf off the loom. There was no hem stitch on this piece and the knots have held absolutely fine. And I also didn't finish the fringe in any way apart from just trimming it um, and then leaving it. So that's one of the most basic fringe treatments you can get really for when you do want to leave the fringe on. Here's a little tip for you. Any fringe treatments that you do, do them when the piece is off the loom before you go to the wet finishing process because as you know, wet finishing sets the threads or the yarns in place and it's so much better to do all of the finishing before you actually wet finish, apart from cutting off um, weft tails afterwards. You do that after it's dry. And this is also a little bit of a form of insurance because some yarns, once you wet finish them, um, particularly if you've used maybe a couple of different yarns in your warp, they might spring up, they might tangle, they might become really ratty. So yeah, that's a good tip to do all your fringe treatments before the wet finish. The next project I have to show you is my heart scarf. This was my free project for last year. You'll find the project here on my YouTube channel. You'll also find it on my blog. Um, here's the scarf and you can see I used a lot of different colors in the, free, in the warp. So I really wanted to make sure I had a fringe for this piece because not only does it look great because there are so many different colors in it, but if you look at the colors as they run vertically in the warp, what happens is if these 
colors say these were cut off well it would still look lovely but leaving them on it kind of accentuates the colors that are above it really makes them pop out of the warp even more so than they naturally do because your eyes are drawn it's like it's like your brain making sense of the piece and identifying the colors within the warp by viewing them in the fringe if that makes sense it probably makes no sense at all and I have no idea about such things I'm just saying this is what I think the brain does when you look at things like this anyway so I definitely decided to keep the fringe on this one and I hem stitched on the loom that will be also in the tutorial if you have seen the tutorial at all and then I twisted the fringes together and that was also a really cool effect because as the color shift sort of moves across so it does in the twisted fringe as well so this one's got a little bit of red in it as well as orange and that sort of twists into each bunch so that's a really lovely way of dealing with fringe and it's also really really secure because I have hem stitched on the loom as I said which is the first step to securing and then I also twisted the fringe and because this is an acrylic yarn it can be a little bit hard to um, know ahead of time how it's going to react after you wet finish um, how much is it going to shrink is it going to uh, be a little bit weird and fluffy or just with acrylics you don't really know until you use them they vary a lot and so um, twisting the fringes worked out really fabulously because it secured the fringe stopped it from tangling looks great and they're also kind of plumped up and they have this fine fuzz about them which I think is very attractive for this particular piece okay so next up I have a piece that is a scarf and it's from my color pooling class that is available on teachable but I never did finish the ends properly or I decided to go with a sort of minimal approach and this is actually the same piece that I'm going to be using for the tutorial today to show you how to eliminate this fringe. So the first thing that I did was I hem stitched this on the loom. This is all hand dyed cotton. The idea of the color pooling scarf is that you arrange the colors in a certain way or if you want to dye it yourself, which I also show in the class, dye it, not dye it, um, you it shows you how to dye in specific sections so that you have the colors running in a certain way to give certain color effects that's what the class is all about anyway back to the fringe so I did hem stitch these little fringe bunches on the loom but once off the loom I just left them plain I quite liked that sort of waterfall effect and the and the, the gradual color changes as you come down the fringe but I'm not so attached to this fringe and so I'm going to use it because it's basically the perfect piece for showing you how to go fringeless on a piece like this. So we're going to come back to this. Okay another type of hem and this is one that I use a lot is your typical machine hem and also you can do this kind of hem by hand as well it's just a little bit different. I have resources for hemming hand wovens and I'll leave them linked down below but this one is a regular machine hem um, it's a double fold hem so fold the first edge over fold the second edge over then sew and it gives as you can see a very neat professional kind of finish and depending on your piece you may end up with some really interesting color effects if your piece is different on each side then um, the hem turned over will be quite attractive as well but as I said I realize not everyone has a sewing machine and especially um, a lot of people won't have a serger like I do as well so I actually serge these raw edges first then I do the double hem you do not have to have a serger absolutely not but if you do sew and you're going to be sewing a lot of your hand wovens and if it's within your budget to do so um, a serger would not be wasted because I use mine constantly I actually bought it when my kids were little um, to make them clothes with because I wanted to finish the seams off nicely so that the clothes were really strong and I've had it ever since and it still works just fine and now I use it for my hand wovens it still does a really fantastic job 
but if you are maybe just starting out sewing your hand wovens or you're not really that into doing it or you don't mind a bit of hand sewing then um, a serger is not a necessary piece of equipment and I'm a, a big advocate for using what you have and you know just not buying all the things all the time there's also the option um, don't discount this option of sometimes borrowing equipment or um, sharing equipment with others if you're lucky enough to know people who are doing similar things to you that could be a good way to go cheaper much cheaper okay now the last piece that I wanted to show you before we go on with the actual tutorial is this beautiful piece of croak broad this is a piece that I wove for Debbie Greenlaw's beautiful book, Croke Broad Patterns, which is right behind me here. And I really liked the idea of giving this piece a very neat finish. If you have the book, you'll see that I also wove a piece with a dark background, which was, um, and both of them are Debbie's designs. And so um, the technique that I'm going to be showing you today for going fringeless, I have used with this piece. Great for things like, uh, let's say, a placemat, a mug rug, something that you want to sit nice and flat. It works really well for that. And depending on a few factors, which I'm going to mention as I go into the tutorial, depending on those factors, you can get the fringelessness fairly invisible. You certainly can't notice it very much with this piece. It kind of looks like it's just been finished at the ends, but there were actually fringes and I did actually have to deal with them. Okay, so it's probably time for me to stop blabbing and start showing you how I would use this method for going fringeless. The good news is you really don't need very much equipment for doing this but you do need a tapestry needle of some sort. And this is the tapestry needle that I highly, highly recommend, as in I don't even use any other tapestry needles anymore after I bought these ones because they're that good. The size is great. Um, they slip through your weaving like butter and I love that. And they're also gold, which makes them easier to find if you're prone to losing things as I am. So the first step is to lay out your piece, lay out your fringes, and you're going to start from one side and it doesn't matter which side makes no difference whatsoever. And you're gonna take the outermost thread. So I'm looking at my first bunch of hem stitched threads and this is like, let's see. Either of these could be the first one really, depending on which way you turn the bunch, but I'm gonna take this one. And here's an important factor of being able to do this fringeless technique. Your fringes do need to be a certain length. So if you've already cut your fringes really short off the loom, you're not gonna be able to do this because you have to have enough thread to thread up in the needle and then to be able to sew it into the piece, up the piece. I'm, I'm not gonna give any specific length for how long it needs to be. These fringes are pretty long, so I have no worries here, but it is better to have them a little bit longer than a little bit shorter, just so you have that extra leeway with it. So I'm just going to thread that through my needle. And then I'm going to come over here and I wanna go into the back, let's see into the back of the hem stitch knot, okay, and pull that through as well as the tail. And then from here, I want to be looking and seeing where my warp threads are laying. And I want to be following the warp thread path um, approximately, you know, straight above this thread as much as I can. So if I were just to lay it out, then I'd be thinking, okay, I need to kind of go pretty close to the edge with this one. And then um, it's going to be fairly straight looking and it's not going to, you know, be going at an angle which would look weird. So in a way I'm wanting to mimic the plain weave a little bit. 
And from there, let's turn this around so that I can see what I'm doing as well. From there, I want to be needle weaving it in and out, in and out, up for probably at least an inch. Depends on the project. Sometimes you'll want to do it a little bit more. Sometimes a bit less will be okay. And it can depend on things like the thickness of the thread and things like that. So I'm just needle weaving in. Uh, fairly similar to how I would needle weave ends in that were like loose ends, weft tails or whatever left over at the end. Now, there are a couple of things that I should mention about the fringe type while I'm doing this. If your fringe pieces, your yarn is really thick, like say it's um, an art yarn or a bulky yarn or whatever it is, then it's probably not gonna work so well for this technique because it's gonna be really visible, probably not so attractive. And if you're using a really thick yarn like that anyway, you probably wanna be showcasing that as a fringe. Okay, so we pull that through to about there. So I want to do it, I want to needle weave it up for as long as I think it needs to be secure. When I pulled that thread through and left it there, it felt really secure. It feels good in place. It's not gonna slip out of place. So let me actually measure that for you. I did say an inch before, but I'm not most, the most brilliant person when it comes to estimating distances. So I will check, because I know that some of you would like to know. Oh, would you look at that? It's very close to an inch. It's just past an inch. So yes, it might depend on your project a little bit as to how far up you go. And once you've got that in place, you just leave that tail in there for now. We're not gonna leave it in there permanently, but just for now. All right, so as I said before, we would be doing this prior to the wet finishing. This scarf has been wet, fi wet finished because it was a finished project but I've brought it back for the purposes of this tutorial. So yours would not be wet finished. So I'm going to the very next thread, warp thread that's available, and I'm doing the same thing. I'm going up into that first knot. I'm sorry if it's difficult for you to see, but it's a little bit difficult for me to get into this knot and try and have my hands out of the way at the same time. Um, the reason I like to go into the knot is just because it's the threads are so close together in there, it's a really good way to secure the yarn at the very beginning. Okay, so now I'm going to do the same thing, but I'm looking for a, a different path. I don't want to go the same path that the last yarn went because that would be too obvious, right? So I'm going to go in next to it, but hopefully in a place where it's not as obvious. Um, and for this one, I'm going to actually follow the opposite stitches. So by that I mean for the last, the last thread you can see, um, these are the weft stitches that went underneath. So I'm going to do the opposing weft stitches for this one to mix it up and make it stand out less. So once I've gone in far enough, I'm going right next to where the last one finished. I'll pull that through. When you pull it through, don't pull it through really hard because you don't want this weft line, you don't want this line at the bottom that you've got there from your hem stitches to be distorted or drawn right in. You just want it left as it was. So that's the second one. And then I'd go to the next one out of the bunch, thread it up. 
Now I never did say that this was a quick technique, did I? <laughs> it's definitely not a quick technique. It's slow, but some people really like this sort of thing. Make sure if you need to that you've got your glasses on or some people might like to use a magnifying glass. Depends how small your weft rows are too. Um, how, how thin your yarn was that you used. So again, I'm just going up next to the last one that I did. And then I'll pull that through and pull the tail through and then it's done. Now uh, for some projects when I'm using this technique, say for example when I did this one, I might have threaded more than one thread at a time just to save a little bit of time. But that was a thinner warp thread and also for this style of weaving because it's weft faced it really buries those warp fringe ends very very well. So I could afford to do more than one at once but for this one I want to be more careful about my placement. I want to know you know that the threads are going to look okay that they're not going to stand out as looking really weird and so I don't want that bulk of two threads running side by side um, in exactly the same way because then that would be quite obvious. While you're stitching or needle weaving, um, turn it over a few times too and check on the other side that everything's looking fine on that side. And if it is, just keep going. So we'll grab the next one and thread that up. And we'll get a little bit of a closer look in this time for those who need that. So to start with, we will take that thread into the hem stitch knot right there. And then I'll just pull that through to make that more simple. And then actually I'm going to take that through again because it's not as secure as it could be. Uh, and then I'm looking at where my last fringe thread went up. So that was it there, going along there. And so I'm aiming to go close to it, but not on top of it. Let's start stitching through there. And yep, yeah, it's that one's running along there, so can be a bit hard to see sometimes, which is actually a good thing. If it's hard to see where your last thread went up, then that means you're doing a good job of weaving it in um, and making it kind of camouflage. All right, and then pull through. All right, so the next one is threaded up there. I'm going to take it into the knot and then look at where my last thread went and I can see it running right along there. It comes out there. So I'm going to be aiming to go about on this row. I've heard from a lot of weavers, um, especially saying that their husband would really like a scarf, but he didn't like the idea of having a fringe. So 
this would be great in that kind of circumstance. Pull through, but not too much, and grab the next thread. So we're gonna keep going like that and keep going until all of those threads are done. And then I'm gonna show you what to do with all of those tails. I've done the first section there and I wanna mention a couple of things before I show you what we do with the warp tails that are left over. Um, the first thing is that it can be, it can get a bit squishy trying to get all of these warp threads in. And sometimes you will double up with another warp thread. You can kind of see there that I've doubled up with another one. And you just need to sort of go with that because you're a little bit squashed for space and it's still going to look really good. So just do what you can if you're starting to feel a little bit squishy and don't worry too much if you get some doubled up ones. The other thing is the edging down here, you'll see because of the hem stitching, it has this kind of bobbly edge. I quite like that. Um, I think that looks nice. It's almost like a little crochet finished on the edge. If you find that your little bobbles are a little bit uneven, you can adjust that by going to the threads above that you've woven in. So say for example, I think this one's sticking out a little bit too much. I can come up to the threads that I actually wove through that and pull on them just lightly and it just slightly adjusts that bobble. And this is one reason that I say don't pull the threads in too firmly when you initially put them in because then you can come back afterwards and adjust them a little bit if you want to. If that edge is bothering you or if you know if one part is sticking out more than the others and you feel like you need to adjust that. All right so I already mentioned that you would be wet finishing this first once you've done the whole fringe wet finish the piece, leave these tails in place and then when it's completely dry these tails are going to be nicely settled into the fabric. Um, they'll be nicely bloomed with the other parts of the fabric. They'll be less noticeable and they'll be more secure. So make sure you do it in that order and then once they're completely dry you can just come in with a nice sharp pair of scissors and uh, admittedly my scissors could do with a bit of a sharpening at the moment. And then you're just going to carefully cut them close to the fabric but not so close that you snip your actual fabric and you're just going to cut them away uh, one by one just trying to separate those two And if you can get them nice and close to the fabric, then they're going to be less noticeable because you're not going to have any little cut ends sticking out of the fabric there. I hope you enjoyed this video. I apologize for some of the filming quality. I've been battling the sun coming in and out, in and out so rapidly. It's just that kind of day in here. So I hope it turned out okay for you. If you have any questions, leave them down below. And until next time, happy weaving.